All right. Hi, it's Riskin um, from Ontario, and I'm here tonight with uh, Lockock's um, newest Duke, Theodric. Um, welcome, Your Grace. Thank you. Good to be on here. Well, I, I'm glad to have you, and I uh, I'm glad that that you're you're a Duke now, and that you aren't still uh, reigning. Um, so <laughs> I'm yeah, sure you're glad too. Yeah, it's it's a bit hard being the only one who's uh, who's officially escaped <laughs> the process so far. Um, I, I think there's been a few um, a few hot airs and things already, but uh, yeah, having that ability to do that crown tournament and, and um, pass that on to another poor sucker was was pretty good last week. Very cool. So I'm sure. Um, um, you know, but we, we, I always start this with your origin story. So if you can tell me like when, where, how you found the SCA, that's where we'll start. Cool. Um, yeah. So when I was a kid, maybe eight or nine, um, my mom had a friend at work who did, um, like proper hardcore Viking reenactment stuff like out in the bush and, and not anything to do with SCA at all. But just, we went along just to have a look one day. And so I was kind of um, hooked from, <laughs> from the time I was a little kid, but never saw anything again until, um, until I went to uni. And I never even really thought about it or knew that it existed. I was wondering through, um, through uh, we have a O week, so orientation week and all the clubs and things come out and, and put on, um, um, they have little stalls and things to, to recruit new members. I walked past the, the college group stand and basically put my name down straight away and, and said, yep, I'm into that. <laughs> and um, didn't even give it a second thought, just signed up and, and started turning up. So, um, yeah, uh, so that was where I met um, the guy who ended up a long time later becoming my knight. Um, he, was, he was kind of um, just finishing up a master's or something there. So he was a bit older and he was pretty much the fighter in the group. Um, and there was a few others around the place, but with the college, it was basically him and, and a couple other people. Um, so the college went pretty well. And uh, so, yeah, I just sort of turned up and started fighting. And I was um, just 18 then. Um, and uh, so, as we all were, stupid and... and uh, <laughs> yeah. Fast. Yeah. Um, so... So when you signed up, was that like uh, to go to fight practice or do, were there other things that the college put on um, through the group? Yeah, so they had a weekly session of, um, um, uh, they called it Stitch and Bitch. I think that was a pretty okay. standard. Um, we don't really hear it anymore. No. Um, but uh, yeah, they had that every week. Um, so I kind of went along with that a bit, but you know, not really my jam. Um, and they did a lot of dancing. Um, the group was kind of big into dancing. So, um, yeah, I stumbled my way through, dropped people on the floor and, <laughs> and tripped over a lot. But, uh, yeah, I did all that stuff. But uh, pretty much just fighting. I was into fighting. Um, but, uh, like, a lot of the other stuff was very interesting. I'm, I make things all the time. It's kind of what I do. Um, and so I, I started kind of building armor and very badly, <laughs> badly building armor um, out of scrap metal in my backyard and um, doing, doing some really terrible clothes. Um, the, the most famous of which was a, a, a floor length um, hooded uh, black faux fur coat, <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> which was incredible. Um, yeah, they, it was on special at the local fabric store. <laughs> so, I wore that for ages and it was horrendous. Very uh, cool though. Um, so did they have loner gear for you? Like, did you start out Sword and Shield? Yeah, absolutely. So I started with a um, strapped heater and a sword and um, um, an old pair of steel legs that, that was in uh, 2001. And so they were about 10 or 15 years old by then. And uh, I used them for about 10 years or something, a long, long time. Um, and uh, a piece of carpet for a kidney armor. Um, and uh, uh, some, some uh, they would have, 
I don't even know if they were legal elbows at that point, but I knocked something together in an old borrowed helmet. Um, but I pretty quickly made a, a helmet with um, with Blaney, the guy who I was training with. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I, I, we put that together. Then years later, about six, seven years ago now, um, I found that when I was doing some weapon testing and pulled it out. And I don't know if the video is still online, but it might be. Um, I pulled it out and put it on a post and I hit it with a sword and I bent the whole thing in half. The one oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know how it got through <laughs> the amount of time that it did, but it was not very well made. Um, so it was Blaney, your knight? Is that the person that, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, eventually, um, that was, um, yeah, I don't know timelines. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm in college, so I don't remember did, <laughs> exactly when things happened. Did you understand, um, you know, sort of like the peerage road and, and the royalty road, and did you have a goal? Um, yeah, I did understand, and my goal was to not be involved in it for a long time. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pretty kind of, uh, well, not vocal anymore, but still kind of heartfelt anarchist, and... Uh, so that whole thing was kind of um, not my deal at all. Um, but uh, eventually I came around, obviously. Um, right. So, <laughs> I mean, it, you could call it Stockholm Syndrome, but it was basically just kind of, I, I met a lot of people and had conversations about what everything was and, and kind of as I got older and things and started to understand that sort of personal development aspect of everything we're doing, um, it just kind of flowed into it. I didn't actually um, um, get knighted until about a year and a bit after I reigned the first time. Yeah, I uh, saw that. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I accidentally won my first crown. <laughs> I went in for a pack, practice run and um, turns out I didn't need a practice run. Um, so uh, um, I was the first unbuilded king in Lockhart. Wow. Uh, and uh, so that was a big step, and there, a couple of others had won um, had won crown and unbelted, but they got knighted beforehand. I think um, Stephen and Draco. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that was I was nowhere near <laughs> ready at that point. Was um, it your was that your first crown ever? Yeah, it was. Oh wow! <laughs> Actually, I watched uh, Sheridan's video. <laughs> Um, the, this morning to kind of get my head in the game. <laughs> and um, it was Sheridan who tricked me into going into that crown. Uh, yeah, we've got, um, I'm sure you've heard about our archery rules and things here. And uh, so it's a bit of a delicate subject at times. And uh, <laughs> he, he was super keen on getting me to go in and uh, basically said there was someone in there who was, was going to definitely win if I didn't go and stop them and, and uh, they were going to ban archery and do all these things and got me all teed up. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's get them. <laughs> and uh, so I went in and, and uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't an easy fight, of course, but um, at that point I was training three, four times a week in, um, in Rowanee in Sydney um, with a lot of our top end guys. So I was pretty, pretty involved in it. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Like, when did you decide that this was something that you loved and you're going to um, concentrate a lot of effort into getting good at it? Um, so I, I uh, got a geology degree at uni just because it seemed like a good thing to do at the time. And um, they paid a lot of money <laughs> back then. We had this mining boom on. And, uh, and so I went into that. And I was doing SCA stuff at college and then kind of I went out straight from college and worked in the mines, um, which is, it's not like in the States where you've got a mining town and then there's a mine and you just kind of live there. You fly into the middle of the desert and there's some like caravans and you live in there with a bunch of murderers. Um, and uh, so I, I went off and did that. And whenever I came back, I'd kind of go to things when I could. Um, and uh, um, yeah, there was a, there was a point where I kind of, 
I reached the end of a job and uh, wanted to come back to Sydney uh, to, to kind of get out of that life. And, um, and I basically just quit all of that for a little bit and, and took a bit of a break and um, just worked a, uh, a minimum wage job walking distance from my share house and uh, just went to training all the time <laughs> and just went, well, uh, I don't want to do that anymore and just started training all the time. Um, and it's all I did, like I'd go to work and, and kind of practice footwork, walking up and down the workshop and um, just to do menial tasks, thinking, thinking about fighting all the time. Um, was your so, share house with other SCA people? No, it was with no. a bunch of maniacs. There was, uh, there was, I think seven of us in a, in a four bedroom house. Wow. Um, in the middle of Sydney, in, uh, in this big party street in the middle of Sydney, um, across the road from a pub. We had, had six pubs within about a block and a half of our house. Um, and the place was just a constant riot 24 hours a day. It was awesome. Wow. I'm sure that was, that was nice after, you know, being in the middle of nowhere with, you know, mining right. and stuff. Yeah, that's right. So was it when you came back from mining that you squired? Um, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the timing on that was at all. Um, Do you remember uh, if you asked him or of, he asked you? Yeah, it was, it was kind of during that period. Um, um, I think it was probably uh, a bit before that because um, I know that I went straight into some pretty kind of regular training with Blaney then. Um, yeah, it was at a, at a festival and, uh, oh, so Rowani Festival is our big event at Easter. Um, so, um, it was at that and I sat down with, um, um, King Yudai and with Blaney, they, they kind of trapped me as I was trying to get into the tavern and, um, sat down and had a conversation and said, you need to settle down and, uh, and kind of learn how to be grown up. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, yeah, uh, at that point, um, I think Blaney was um, still a squire to uh, Jukutha from the West. Um, and uh, so he said, come and come and hang out with me and do the stuff. Or uh, if you want, I can introduce you to Uther. And I said, well, that's great, but <laughs> he's 15,000 kilometers away. Right. So, <laughs> um, um, so basically, I kind of hooked up with Blaney then and became his squire when he was knighted shortly after that. Um, and so, yeah, then, then we kind of did a lot of work together through that period when I was, uh, when I moved back into Sydney and that. So you, you said you were going to practice in Sydney, um, which I'm guessing is not the barony of Rowini. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So oh, it is. Sydney is Rowini, yeah. Okay. Well, so, are there that many fight practices in the Sydney area a week or were you traveling? <laughs> um, back then there was, um, um, I think there was uh, the official kind of Rowney fighter practice. Then there was um, another one that was uh, maybe one of the smaller groups or something, one of the shires or cantons or something like that. And um, then there was a couple of household trainings as well. Um, and one of them, or the kind of big one that that we would just go and beat each other um, was run by uh, Count Berengar, um, who was the guy who originally started kicking the crap out of me at training when I first turned up. Um, he would come down from Sydney to Wollongong, which was about an hour, hour and a half drive. He'd come down for our backyard practice. And, and um, so he was at that point when I started, maybe 10 years before, a bit less than that. And um, he was traveling around doing all his training and um, he'd come down and <clears throat> there was a few of us guys who were big and meaty and stupid and he'd come down and practice all <laughs> his tricks on us. Um, so yeah, and then we ended up doing that big training session weekly there. So. Did, did Blaney bring um, some of like Duke Uther's training methods um, to you, like all the drills and you know, the, um, I can't remember the pamphlet, the name of it that Sig wrote, like did you guys did, do that kind of stuff? Yeah, and that was kind of the, the 
things was that um, I'm I'm about the same size as Uther, um, not as athletic probably, um, but uh, I move in a really similar way, and so that was part of the thing I think in that original conversation was is this guy who does this stuff and he's a big buff head and he moves this way. Um, these techniques might work. And then Blaney was getting all that, doing videos back and forth with Uther at the time. So I brought those drills in. Blaney was very much, um, uh, I don't know if you guys have been having that conversation recently of um, warriors versus swordsmen. Um, so so uh, we've been talking a bit about general style of, of um, how people fight and, and the two big camps are warriors and swordsmen, a warrior being, um, a big berserker barbarian dude who just uses strength and violence. Um, and then a swordsman who just uses technique. And there's a, there's a spectrum as there always is um, between the two points, but generally someone will, will focus on technique or they'll focus on kind of um, brutality. Um, I'm very much in the brutality camp. Um, Blaney was very much in the technique camp. Um, he was a little guy. Um, and that, that was one of the things we did was go through some of those drills from from those guys in the West and um, and then shift from me just using that that size and strength to get everything done um, to uh, actually trying to use technique. And his, his uh, mantra was fight like a little guy, um, which is an interesting thing to do when you're 6'6 six, six and can like you mean you don't have to <laughs> no, wait, i'm a little guy today um so that that was a big kind of shift and that that's what kind of pushed me ahead and and got me out of just being a, a shield wall grunt interesting um do, don't you think though that once you get the swordsmanship part you can bring the brutality back in i mean because i would say that that uther is definitely a swordsman but he has a very brutal fight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's, uh, I think it's mostly about your kind of natural tendencies rather than, than like you can utilize, once you've got that set of tools, you can use whatever tools come out of the box that you need at the time. Um, I, back then all I had was violence and I didn't have the technique to, to bring out and, and get things done. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like, um, you can, you can use just the technique. Like if I'm, if I'm doing a, if I'm having a big thrust day, like, and I'm, and I'm focusing on that thrust game, I'll just use the technique and everything will be really kind of neat and, 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 uh, kind of low power and low energy in the fight. Um, and some days I'll just wind up and, and kind of smash people. Um, but to be able to combine the two together is where the real craft of it lies. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so how long did you work with Blaney before you decided that you were going to do this test crown? <laughs> um, well, I mean, we've been training right from the start. And um, um, so it was uh, 2001 to 2009. So okay. I've, I've Joined in 2001 and I did about, um, uh, um, so so then I um, came back to Sydney about 2006, something like that. Um, and then uh, went in that crown at the end of, the end of 2008, it was the GFC. My <laughs> I won crown and caused the GFC. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I was working for a, uh, a at that time, I was working in a, um, an office in the middle of Sydney uh, uh, for this uh, sort of investment company um, and basically walked in in the morning in that October 2008 and they said, pack up and go home. <laughs> we, we just lost like some stupid amount of money. I don't even remember anymore, but, but millions of dollars. They just got pulled out of the company overnight. <laughs> they just said, go home. Um, so that was about a month after I won Crown. I was say you um, win crown and then these global crises happen. Chaos. Chaos is my jam. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was, it was about, uh, like I've been fighting six, seven years, something like that. And then it was about probably two or 
two years or so of kind of intense training um, to have that, that led to that point. And that was, that was in no way kind of an end point or anything of, of that process. I was kind of in the middle of, of ramping up and, and skill building and, and kind of doing all those things that you, you do when you're young and keen and training right. several times a week. Um, and so it was just kind of a, a thing that I was doing and I went into as a skill tester and obviously had an idea of what was, what was going to happen. Um, but yeah, it was from that, it was another year and a half or something after that rain, um, before I, um, was ready to consider an offer and also, um, go on. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I don't know how many times you've heard this over the, the past year, but at that point when I was knighted, even, um, I was, I knew nothing and I was not ready and I was just a stupid kid who could swing a stick. Um, and I've learned, I've learned twice as much since then than I, than I ever did leading up to it. I think even the people that felt ready at the time, like once you are in the stew, I guess, and, and for a while you like, you don't even realize um, how much you don't know. Like you don't know how much you don't know. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, it is sort of a common theme, um, but it's not very often that someone says at the time they were knighted that they knew that they, <laughs> they didn't know very much. Um, I think well, that that's, awareness comes later. That's what I was thinking. Uh, is, um, probably, if anyone's, if anyone's uh, a hot stick squire considering going in crown, uh, be careful because if you win, it's going to just spill all those illusions and and um, you're probably not going to have a great time. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I got to, to see behind the curtain there, which I wasn't ready to do and I didn't understand what was going on. And, like, um, turned up to, to my first uh, shift meeting. <laughs> I was horrified. <laughs> yeah. Um, um. <laughs> Well, let's get to that in a second. But um, did you have any kind of sports background? <laughs> no. No? Uh, no. When I was playing, I played um, uh, rugby. Um, um, but yeah, uh, my my uh, interests were all completely dirty and, and kind of on the on the hideaway in the dark spectrum. <laughs> rather than, okay. But I could, yeah, I was completely uncoordinated and. Uh, probably for the first, actually, it was during that time uh, of uh, of training in Sydney that uh, that I learned not to fall over every time I fought. <laughs> I was kind of well known at the time for for just falling flat on my ass every time I tried to fight because <laughs> so I just couldn't stand up. Um, that's how unsporty I was. So you just you spend a lot of time figuring out balance. Like my husband took him a while too, just yeah. to figure that out. Yeah. Um, yeah so tell. So tell me about the crown you won. Like, how big was it? Um, did um, you fight in the finals? So uh, I think that was about eight or nine in it. We only have small crowns generally and uh, because they're dispersed all over the country, um, all over two countries. Um, so it's often difficult to, to kind of get numbers because you might have to travel thousands of miles away. Right. So those are, I think there was about eight or nine in there. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about how I fight is that I, I kind of, if I think about what I'm doing, it doesn't work. I have to, I have, to have no consciousness <laughs> when I fight. And so I often don't remember what happened, <laughs> especially 10 years ago. Um, right. So um, I know there was a tournament and I was at it. <laughs> um, I can't tell you a lot more than that. Um, I, I remember that um, there was a lot of interesting fights and a lot of people that I kind of didn't, um, wasn't really prepared for. And so, so it kind of pushed me a lot, but kind of a lot of those skills were there ready to, ready to go from all that intensive training. So um, there was a bit of luck there. Um, the final I fought uh, uh, for the called Sir Philippe, um, it was a lefty. And thankfully, there was a lot of lefties in Sydney, and so that was a big, big advantage, I think, in that I'd been training regularly with a with a lot of really good 
left-handers. Um, but that was a that was a really intense fight, and uh, uh, at one point it came down to just wraps until somebody missed one and just wrap, 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 And then I got him somehow, um, completely accidentally. Because um, I got that, uh, because my um, my technique wasn't in line with my mental game. Like I, I had the mental kind of ability to to fight at that level, but the, there wasn't that, that toolkit, right? right. So I got stuck in this wrap loop. <laughs> and, I, and I literally could not do anything other than rap until something someone died. Right? <laughs> I have that uh, problem with the backhand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, so. Did you do something to train the mental aspect of your fighting, or was that something that came naturally to you? Um, both. Uh, so the I have to go back a little bit. Um, so what I'm kind of referring to, and, and if you're after a book, anyone out there is after a book, the book of five rings, Musashi, um, every time, so for 20 years, I've been reading that book. And every time I read it, there's something that I understand that I looked at it the first time and went, what is that? It's, what a dumb thing to say. And you go back 15 years later and you're like, oh yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so one of the things there he talks about is that that kind of meditative Buddhist state of of no mind, right? Of the the um, so being able to to experience the world around you and and bypass your conscious thought process to send those stimuli straight to your your system to react to, right? So um, so kind of. I had an interesting kind of teenage period, um, a lot of sort of street fighting and, and sort of, yeah, violence. Um, okay. and, um, and so through that little kind of period, I got that understanding that um, in moments of stress and, and danger and fear, you get that accelerated time kind of response. And if you've, if you've experienced it, you know, um, if you've ever crashed a car or, or had something like that, then you, you flick into that little state where everything is, is you remember every detail. Um, one of them I rolled, a, I rolled a car in the, out in the bush. Um, and uh, every time the car rolled over, I still remember the grass hitting me on the face through the smashed window and the dust in my mouth as my head hit the ground every time the car rolled. Like that level of detail and memory um, is a result of that that kind of the short circuit of the experience through your mind, um, and that's what you use to to develop that that kind of state in fighting of being able to react to something without actually thinking about it, um, and and letting your body do the work um, and take out that point two of a second or whatever of of thinking time that's needed. So um, the first time that I had that in, in SCA fighting um, was um, against Sir Sheridan, Duke Sheridan. Um, and uh, we were having a fight, it was just pickups or something. We were fighting and like, it was, it was a fast technical fight. And um, I remember now having that fight, we we're both on our knees and um, he started throwing some wraps and I was, I was looking over this way at his shield side, trying to do something over here. And I remember looking that way and blocking wraps over here that were behind my head, right? Because that, that um, all those sensors are feeding straight into the muscles, basically. Like some peripheral part of me saw what he was doing and responded to that um, without me having to think about it. And that was, that was kind of a, oh, <laughs> but yeah. I realized that was a thing. So I, I sat down and spoke to Blaney about it and we kind of worked that through and, and he had some techniques of, of meditation and, and things like that to, to switch that on and off, um, which took a lot of, of learning and, and figuring out. Um, but yeah, 
now nowadays I often don't bother, but like if it, if there's something serious on, um, I'll I'll go through that meditative process and then can just snap in and out of that that kind of mindset of of just reacting to the world. Um, is yeah, is the, that? Oh. Go ahead. Um, so in, in the crown a year and a half ago <laughs> now the the last crown. Um, I, I went through that process for about three days beforehand. And by the time we got up to drive to the tournament in the morning, um, I had to get England to drive the car because I couldn't think enough <laughs> to drive a car. Um, Cause I was just so kind of, um, yeah, I was, I was so much in that kind of focused state that um, I would kind of fixate on things and, yeah. Okay. I, I was going to ask um, how long before the tourney you would do it. So it sounds like days in advance, you you prep your mental game. When I'm serious, um, yeah. Uh, uh, so I mean, that week I've been I've been studying and watching videos of all of the competition and and um, and doing a lot of prep work, um, and so that had kind of kicked it into it. But you know, um, it. It's as easy as, or it's as, it can be as simple as an hour before the tournament, sit down and, and kind of regulate breathing, um, visual, visualizations and, um, and uh, focus. Uh, basically those three are kind of what gets me into it. Do you use a, like a trigger um, before your fights to, to trigger it? No, you don't, okay. No, uh, I don't. It's, um, I take the, the the little moment of the um, salute process to to switch on, but it's not it's not a trigger. If uh, the trigger is um, is a good or a hold, so those are the triggers so, because it's really important to be able to trigger out rather than in. Um, I can prepare myself into the state, but to to get out, there has to there has to be that like little mental fail safe. It's all sounding very strange and psycho right now. But it's no, really... no, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah, so usually I'll just kind of um, just just kind of go in and out as needed. But um, yeah, if, if you have a trigger to go in, then you, you might go in when you don't want to, um, um, which is not an issue so much as keeping on going um, and being unrestrained when you have to stop. Interesting. Um, was this last crown that you won um, the first crown you had entered since <clears throat> the last time you reigned? No. No, I, I've been in about, uh, I think, three others. Uh, so one of them was uh, um, pretty local to me and was uh, uh, no shields tournament. So there was a lot of weird and wacky weapons out there. And, um, and uh, I got to the finals of that one and came up against the pole arm guy in the tournament, finally, um, Henri. And um, he just kicked my ass. <laughs> I think I was undefeated up until that and he just got me into, I mean, out. <laughs> um, and uh, another one, uh, uh, there was just I went I went way off into the middle of nowhere and somewhere where there shouldn't have been many people and just all these all these um, sharks turned up. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, and uh, one again, I, I like one of the things was um, uh, yeah. So the third one, I turned I went there because I knew there'd be a lot of really great fighters there and I wanted to to push that. And the same as this recent one, I knew that was going to be a really good good tournament with a lot of great fighters there. And so, um, and, that, and that comes from a bit of that, um, just a bit of, um, I don't know, um, maybe wanting to make up for the, the fluke of the first one. Um, I've, I've always felt that um, um, maybe uh, I need to prove a bit more than I did the first time around well, it's, it sounds to me when you explain it, though, that the first one really wasn't a fluke because you were training quite hard for it, right? Yeah, and you, you had 
expectations and you had been goaded into it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, looking back, it was not a fluke and, uh, and it, was a, it was a good tournament and I had prepared and was ready for it. Um, at the time, I guess that, that kind of arrogance was still there and that, that idea got into my head. Um, but, you know, and, and for a second go around, I wanted, I wanted to like show off. <laughs> and, um, and it didn't matter at that point. Like it's, it's never really mattered to win again. Um, so. So let's talk about your first reign. Um, you talked a little bit about how you weren't ready to be thrown um, into that and to see behind the curtain. Um, what was something that you weren't expecting um, that surprised you? <laughs> the paperwork. <laughs> the paperwork. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, we have a, um, no, I won't go into that. Um, I was advised to put aside time each week um, to go through emails and correspondence and all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was 25 and England was 22, 23. Um, and uh, we were just bumming around, <laughs> not doing much of anything. Um, and yeah, suddenly we're dealing with just or emails every day, boxes of paperwork, and and um, all these all these big dramas of the kingdom, and and dealing with banishments and and um, really important stuff. <laughs> like yeah. I was just there for a fight. <laughs> okay, what was your favorite part of the first strain? Um, I think uh, at the time I kind of enjoyed. Um, having my little little crew of warriors and we did we did a um, uh, bunch of shield wall stuff which was really cool and and um, that was all really good at the time looking back I think um, what the best part of it was is seeing that that drinking and fighting and and rolling in mud puddles at 2am probably isn't all there is to the society and um, and getting forced is the wrong word, but but getting the opportunity to to um, go along to all these things that I would never choose to to be involved in, um, and seeing that range of of activity, I think was a really great thing, and and it's something that pushed me after the rain to go and, and seek more things out that that I wouldn't have otherwise. Very cool. That's super cool. Um, did, I, I kind of I'm interested in in how the peerage meetings were different than you thought they would be. I because I, I'm always interested um, when there's unbelted kings to know like one. Do you think you were judged harder? Um, two. Do you think it delayed your knighting? Um, and three, like, how did you deal with sort of the the weird kind of thing that like, that you're the top now, but you've never been part of this group? Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to uh, talk out of school, as they say. Um, but um, part of the the thing that the peerages do is to is to look at candidates and, and people's, um, people's students and to examine the work that they do, but also the kind of person they are. Um, and I walked into that without a good understanding of that process. Um, and like I'd, I'd been briefed on what happens and how it all works and everything, but without seeing it in action, um, it was pretty shocking at the time to see um, what those conversations involved. Um, and so, like, I think uh, it's important to, to kind of discuss who people are and, and how they can, can work for the society and, 
and um, you know whether they're good people or not. Right. Uh, but uh, like I'd never considered that that happened. <laughs> um, and uh, we had a long, a long shiv meeting that that first big one that I went to. It was long and it was contentious and there was some some big arguments and then along with that um i think uh not being part of that prior to to walking into that meeting um we we kind of probably didn't handle it as well as we should have in terms of of our role as the crown um and i walked out of that meeting and i uh, Sheridan was with me there, talking about Sheridan all day. And it was probably just because I watched the video <laughs> earlier. But um, um, yeah, we walked out of that meeting and I turned around and I said, when I step down, don't put me back on that list in there. I will, I will tell you <laughs> when, when the trauma has settled <laughs> and, um, and I'm happy to talk about it again. Um, but yeah, then we went to went to all the other the peerages and, and a whole bunch of other meetings and it all, we kind of got into the flow and it was all fine. But yeah, that first one was a bit intense. And well, um, I think it would be hard to be strong and be like, hey, hey, you know, this isn't going anywhere good. Let's just, you know, cut it off um, when yep. you haven't been in there before and you don't know the personalities and you're um, used to being, you know, the, the SCA has layers, right? And you're used to being in a lower layer. Um, that would be yeah, hard. Yeah. I mean, half of those guys were the guys who kick the shit out of me at training every week. Right. They're right. they're on my trainers. They're they're my idols, and they're the, they're the guys who tell me what to do. And suddenly, I'm there in the big chair. <laughs> right. Right. And nobody handled that well. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, how was this last reign different for you? Um. Obviously, you. I mean. We had the whole COVID situation and you guys had to do some virtual reigning, um, but you did get a little smidge at the beginning where you got to go to things. Mm. Yeah, and I had a few little littler events and local stuff um, around where we are. But uh, basically I'm, what year is it, 21? <laughs> uh, I'm 12 years older now. Like I'm, right. I'm a grown up now. <laughs> Um, um, I've got a three-year-old, so that helps me deal with the peerages. Uh, um, and, you know, There's actually a lot of truth in that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, between then and now, I've, I've done, I've, I've just had all this experience of life and, you know, um, I've been a manager of 30 people, you know, um, and, you know, been involved in a lot of a lot of big stuff in the world that that kind of helps build those personal skills that that lay to manage the stress of it right. um, and the processes behind it and and um, um, just keep a bit of a handle on everything. And also, uh, post March, England did all the work. <laughs> I put my feet up and made videos every now and then. Um, I'm here to fight, and there's no fighting on. <laughs> she fights too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. She's winning the next round. Look out. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm, rooting, I'm rooting for all of them down there. <laughs> um, yeah, so this time, I mean, apart from the weirdness of, of, um, of being an online role-playing game now, uh, uh, you know, we, we do things like uh, we've, we've set up, uh, or we did set up, um, online peerage meetings. So we're, we're so dispersed, right, that that when we have a peerage meeting, there might be just the locals there and then it might take five years before someone from the other side of the continent um, comes up in a meeting because everyone turns up and they're like, we, we have no idea who these people are. Right. Um, and so we, we kind of called everyone up and said we're going to have online peerage meetings and we set up a Zoom meeting for everyone and we did that and I think that was really good and and being able to see that need and follow it through and get it done um, I think is something that we never would have been able to do before um, 
but having that confidence to go, we're going to change everything. <laughs> we're doing things this way now. Um, um, that just comes with being old, <laughs> bitter, not caring. On, on a personal level, I'm, I'm curious, um, do you utilize like uh, pictures and videos and stuff like that in your peerage meetings? Um, so that you can have more of a hands-on sort of idea of who the candidates are since you guys are, I mean, our kingdom is big and we're nowhere near as big as you. Um, not really. Okay. It's, it's really no than, well, I assume everyone else is in meetings. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, what we want to do now and what I'll be kind of pushing from my rocking chair on the porch is, um, to, to maintain those online meetings as a thing going forward so that we can have that connection. Um, and I'm adding your idea in. <laughs> well, I just um, think it would be so easy to, I think it would be so easy because you guys are actually fighting. I mean, you, you some of your areas anyway have, have practices and everything, and it would be so easy to share video um, yeah, and be yeah. like, this is who this guy is and this is what he's doing or this is what she's doing. Um, yeah, you don't need that. that. Uh, I'm looking at the gym squire at the pickups tomorrow. Like, what's he look like? Oh, I don't know. He's got a red shield. Right. <laughs> Here's what he looks like. Here's his kit. <laughs> yeah, so. uh, that's a good advantage of, of doing things online. And I think um, I think we've seen a lot of things this year that that are going to help the society in the future to to get better and to to share things from uh, around all the kingdoms um so yeah i mean it's shit and um it's not going to disappear overnight but um it'll it'll get back to more normal and we can add all these things in that we've learned and um and yeah i think it's going to make it better in the end yeah um i would agree um i when i was looking at your order of precedence entry um you have a defender of the west um, can you tell me how that happened? Um, I came over to Australia um, to kind of visit the, the extended family. Um, uh, Blaney sent me over um, just before I was knighted. Um, and uh, so I was... I was an unbelted count, which was a lot of fun running around Australia War. And um, some of the, the Westley girls had my coronet and they'd chase around after me trying to make sure I put it on. <laughs> and I snuck off into the dark to get drunk with random people. Um, and um, yeah, so I went over and, um, and stayed with Uther and, and uh, went down to the wall with those guys and, and fought with the, the Army of the West there, which was fantastic. Um, great, great experience getting the, in the pipeline for the first time. We have archers here. We don't have pipelines. <laughs> it was a revelation. Um, yeah, so that was probably uh, probably one of the, the best bits of fun fighting I've ever done was was uh, getting shoved into the front of the, the West Kingdom uh, army with a pike surrounded by all fun. the troops from the King of the West and just walking in and annihilating everyone that came across. That was great. Yeah, they have some killers over there. That's yep. that's fun. Um, so did you go by yourself um, out there? Yeah, the, the first time I did. And then um, we went back. Uh, I took uh, England over the, another time uh, a few years later. Um, but yeah, the first time I was just kind of by myself, knew nobody. I talked to um, um, everyone's called Rachel, uh, Duchess Asa. <laughs> um, and um, I talked to her online, kind of setting some things up, um, but had never really spoken to anyone and didn't know what was going on. Um, the first day I was there, um, Uther left me in his apartment and went to work and said, yeah. there's the door code, is <laughs> Oakland, have fun. Um, I didn't, couldn't even buy a cup of coffee because I went to the local cafe and nobody could understand what I was saying. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Just got stuck. Um, what a leap of faith. Yeah. Yeah, that, that kind of, that really huge experience. Um, yeah, just fantastic. Just seeing that that scale difference, if nothing else. Um, Australia was 
three times the size of our biggest event here and and um, going the the Outlands Prize Tourney and things like that. Um, yeah, I'd heard that was one to go in, and that was kind of what pushed me to go to Australia in the first place. That's one of my faves. Oh, it was so good. It's still my favourite tournament that I've ever been in. Doing that, it's like an hour of of um, King of the Hill <laughs> for the first round. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. It takes forever, but you know, if you're not fighting, you there's so many good things, good fights to watch. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was great, and then um, two Madu guys, uh, like one after the other, booted me out of the final. I somehow <laughs> somehow got into the final and just Madu guys. Jeez, thanks. <laughs> so, um, do you have squires? Uh, I have. Um, Foster Squire at the moment is um, um, Hala, Yalskona Hala. Um, and uh, so her and her uh, husband, uh, Thorolf, came over from Antir. I know them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're with our, our guys now. Um, and uh, so during the, the past year, um, um, she kind of came and said, hi, and would you like to help me out? And I said, sure, busy, <laughs> I'll get back to you. So um, we've done a few things here and there over the past year or two, but nothing too intensive yet. Um, they, they live about an hour and a half away. And so um, um, there's, a, there's a bit of a travel issue there at the moment, obviously. Um, but yeah, before that, I had another squire and he's been knighted. Um, for a few years now, um, yeah, it's it's not something that um, is a focus of mine. Um, I'm I'm pretty transient. Um, I'm a bit of a, a hobo and never really stay around anywhere too long. So I, I find it a bit. Um, it, it feels like it might be a little bit unfair to start something that might take ten years when I might only be in the place for a year and then disappear off to somewhere else. So. Um, I try and keep a bit to myself and, you know, nobody's asked. <laughs> so you, you wait for people to ask. If you don't have the balls to come up and ask, the answer's automatically no. <laughs> if you have the audacity to come up and ask, the answer's almost definitely no. So, See, that, that's what I always tell my, my uh, child. You know, if you don't ask, it's always no. So you might as well ask, right? <laughs> But it's very cheap to come out. I'm not sure I like it, so maybe don't ask either. <laughs> Just kind of stay away. Okay. Um, all right. Did did we not talk about something that you would like to talk about? Um. Not really. I've talked a lot about a lot about uh, paperwork and administration, which is all we've done for the past year. Um, but no, I mean. There's a there's a million no shit there I was stories but that could go all day and um, there's nothing particular I'd like to get out there in the world. Okay, um, did you bring your sword? I did. All right, let's look at it. I brought a sword. Okay. <laughs> this is I think this is the one that I took in Crown and by the tape it looks like it is because it is ragged, um, but. It's a pretty good example of what I use because what I use is, tends to be ragged and beat up. Um, so this one is actually 85 centimeters. Let me do a bit of a. It's gonna. It looks pretty short for how tall you are. Yeah. So this is very frustrating at the moment. It's about um, it's about two inches shorter than I'm used to. Um, oh, I can't find the thing here. If anyone knows what I, I could do it. Let's see. 33. 30. Yeah, so that's super short. Yeah, and so normally um, normally I'd use about two inches longer than that. Um, so not very long, but I got really long arms. Um, so <clears throat> um, I don't find that it's a disadvantage and I don't like to play long anyway. Um, I like being in that sort of middle range. Um, and so keeping it a bit shorter means that I can maneuver 
in those tight spaces really well. This is this is too short because I keep air swinging. <laughs> my, my brain is set for about two inches longer. Um, and so I use, a, I make my own little tips out of foam and tape. Um, I like those rubber tips you can get, the little ones that slide on the end, but I can't keep, get them to stay together because I hit with that section all the time. Whenever I'm at long range, I hit with the very tip and it rips those tips off. Um, so I just use foam on the end. Is, is that tool dipped? Did you tool dip your tip or is that just no, tape? It's just, it's just, um, okay. uh, just tape. Okay. Because, uh, you know, it'll come off in a couple of weeks and I've got to be able yeah. to just put it in five minutes. Um, so, yeah, I like to keep them relatively short so that I can play that middle game. Um, the handle is important. So yeah. what I do on those handles is I take it down. Um, um, I've got little kind of feminine hands, but they're long, long fingers. Um, so I keep the grip fairly large, but shave off um, kind of a little nugget either side at the top and bottom. And basically what that is, is that um, it's, it's that bit, that bit, that bit, and that bit. Um, and so I take it down around that, that, um, that finger, finger and thumb. And then the other section is, yeah. Anyway, it's right there on my pinky because these two middle fingers don't really do anything. I hold on with the top and just use the pinky. So um, I'll hold the stick, feel where it's uncomfortable and shave off those parts until it's comfortable in that grip. There's no, there's no science to it. Um, is, the plastic helps always. Do you prefer heavy or light? Is that a heavy stick or? No, uh, light, as light as light. they can get. Okay. Um, and um, I don't want to have one here. I've got swords all over the house here. Um, but um, like steel swords are pretty light. They're lighter than a, a heavy rattan stick. So I don't see why you would use a heavy rattan stick when an actual steel sword is light. So, um, and you just have one trigger in there? Yeah, yeah. And that's something I went to um, maybe five years ago. And uh, it's just great. Like I don't really use it as a as the a trigger for movement um it's just a lot easier to pick up and put down yeah um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah always a tip um i would never use a sword without a tip because a sword has a tip and um when you're um when you're using an actual sword for like in a in a historical kind of context, the tip is way more important and useful than the edges. Um, and killing shots are thrusts. Um, so a lot of my um, actual technical technique um, comes from things like uh, I-33, um, the 13th century fencing manual, things like that. That's, um, that's using that more fencing style and the tip work and things like that. I use a lot more of that as the foundational technique than I do um, kind of percussive rattan fighting. Um, and so the tip is really important and it's completely integrated into what I do. Um, so I probably couldn't fight without a tip. When, when did you get into um, taking the I-33 and, and putting it into your own fight? Really early. Really early? Probably about five years um, um, Yeah, I've, somewhere around that, that kind of, kind of five to seven years, I've, I've kind of got into um, center groups and, um, and, and picked up a book on that. Um, and uh, started integrating thrusts and things into it. And so it's kind of foundational to what I do. Um, and obviously there's a lot built on top of that now. Um, but yeah, that, that, um, the, the, one of the big things in that technique is to use that buckler as a cover for the arm. Um, and so that's what I do with this thing. <laughs> um, is basically use it like a buckler, but bigger. Um, bigger. And I, 
I use that to cover my arm and use my sword to block a lot. Um, um, and yeah, use timing, use timing and the sword for defense um, and use the shield as a bit of an area cover, but mostly to block the arm. Interesting. That's cool. All right. Well, let's do the final 10. Um, what event have you never gone to that you would like to go to? Um, there's a whole list of people who really understand what they are. <laughs> like, like, I've been to pretty much every event in, in our kingdom. Um, I went to the one thing that I knew that I wanted to go to in the States. Um, but, you know, probably Penzig is my, my go-to because a lot of the guys from here go over regularly. Um, and I think it is um, probably just a bit of a laugh. So <laughs> come, go and have some fun. And it seems like a good level of chaos. Um, if you could fight anyone in the world, who would it be? Trump. Who? Trump. Oh, Trump. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Um, what uh, is your... Okay, go ahead. No, I have an actual answer. Um, I, I reckon probably anyone from like the Eastern US, because I've never fought anyone from over there. Um, never really looked into their style or what they do and um yeah that complete unknown is something that that i would look forward to yeah if you went to pensick you'd get a lot of that so <laughs> yeah. um what's your favorite estrella story <laughs> i went in the roses tourney um and uh i don't even know how i did in the roses tourney it was kind of later in the week i think and I was completely exhausted. Um, and it was in the afternoon after after more morning. Um, and uh, so I went in and, and had a lot of fun and, and you know, showed off a bit for the, the ladies gallery, which was huge. Like for, from our perspective, it was terrifyingly huge, <laughs> like a grandstand of roses. Um, and so there was multiple fields going. Um, and uh, ended up fighting this guy who I have no idea who he was. Um, but uh, we were basically just perfectly evenly matched. And, uh, and so the fight dragged on and on and on. Um, couldn't touch each other. Everyone else on all the other fields and all the other fights wound down and everyone in the tournament was standing on the side. We're in front of this grandstand of roses and there's just the two of us slogging at each other. And, um, both end up on our knees, just, just fight, 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 until I literally, uh, like, I lost because I could not lift my shield off the ground to block my head. <laughs> he swung at me just like slow motion, uh, and I couldn't move my shield. And just, all right. <laughs> like, all right. And, uh, uh, cheers from the, the gallery. <laughs> and so I stood up, turned around, and took a bow, and as I took a bow, my pants fell down. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh no! Uh, I shuffled away in shame. <laughs> yeah, that was good. That's funny. That's funny. Um, who are your favorite people to watch fight? Um, Uther. Uther is number one because every time I, every time I see him do something, I go, I can do that. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I should look like when I fight. So I watch his fights and I go back and watch mine. Like, Why doesn't mine look like that? <laughs> um, yeah, so still now I, I go back and refer to, to all his stuff to, to kind of poly, try and polish mine. Um, do you have a mentor or a hero in the SDA? And if so, who is it? Currently? Um, not really. Um, I've kind of have been, I've, I've kept to myself a bit for a lot of years now. Um, I don't know if you can see any of this. This is this is my house that I'm building. Oh. So I'm here 24 hours a day, all the time. Been here for three and a half years or something now. And um, that's that's 99% of what I do. Um, and uh, yeah, we were we were looking forward to getting back involved in in the society and and like get around, travel, meet everyone, do all those things. 
and then we've been at home. <laughs> so, yeah. like, so, you know, I kind of, I, I have been pretty independent the last decade or so. And then um, spending all this time here myself, I kind of haven't been as involved in, in socializing as I should be. And I'm not, I'm not pushing myself to, to learn or to grow or any of those things these days. Um, but yeah, back into that shortly once we're done with this and um, yeah, at the moment, no. <laughs> what a sense of accomplishment though, like you building your own house, so. It'd be pretty good. One if day. you, go ahead. One day it'll be good. Oh, wow, okay. If you had to recommend one event in your kingdom for someone out of kingdom to go to, what would it be? Um, depends on what you're after. So there's two, two big ones that, that I find really great. The first is Rowney Festival and it's just, it's a bit of everything. Um, there's, there's a lot of fighting, um, but it's not all there is. There's a lot of, there's a lot of singing, there's big AMS stuff goes on. Um, and, uh, like lots of parties and things like that. So that's pretty good. Um, and the other one is, um, Canterbury Fair in, uh, New Zealand, um, which the, the Kiwis aren't as fighting focused as the Australians are. Um, and so their event is a lot longer. It's, it's like a week and a half or something. Wow. And, uh, and they have loads of stuff and, um, just great welcoming people and, and, the site is beautiful, um, and uh, yeah, just so lots of lots of all the rest of the SCA is focused there. Um, so yeah, I I very much enjoy that, and, and it's well worth going to. Cool. Um, let's see, what book do you think everyone on the path to knighthood should read? Sashi. Sashi. Get it early. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You you'll read it forever. And there's always something in there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know I've said it before, but I, I have it on um, on CD and I just put it in my car and I listen to it while I commute and I always get something new out of it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. If you could change one thing about the SCA, what would it be? Just one. <laughs> just one. Uh, Less paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a real good question. I wasn't expecting that. What I'd like to see is, um, a kind of more, um, not publicity, but, but a better public face and a bigger public face. Like I want, I want us to be on TV, you know, <laughs> like, um, there's, there's so many people who do this and, and it's a huge community um but i think maybe partly because of the nature of who we are um it's quite closed um and i know it's a bit different over there with with the um the ren fairs and things like that and i know there's a lot of random people who turn up at penzik and all that sort of stuff um so i think it's a little bit different um but yeah like i think there's there's no reason why we should be um kind of tucked away and doing our own thing um why not have public events and and um showcase it on tv and and like get everybody involved like i think it'll be good um what is your favorite in kingdom tradition hmm. i don't know <laughs> Okay, you can pass. Traditions we have. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, sorry. Can't okay. do what do you think is the most important trait to become a successful fighter? Um, I think uh, the ability not to give up. Just, it's going to take a long time. And you have to just accept that um if you if you want to do it you have to just keep doing it forever there is no end to it um it's going to be hard it's going to hurt um you have to clean your armor and you have to cut your armor and you have to go to places and just turn up and do it and 
get your ass kicked over and over and over and over and over. And um, yeah, just just keep doing it. And it's a it's a grind, but there's there's nothing like it. Um, so it's not a chore. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be fast. <laughs> it's just going to go forever. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much for uh, talking to me. And um, uh, I, I really appreciate um, you giving me your, your first free weekend after stepping down. Um, so thanks yeah. for that. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and tomorrow I am talking to Duke Rorick from the Outlands. So that should be pretty cool. Um, I really appreciated this. And I hope that you and Hala have a great relationship. I think she's pretty cool. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.